Hi, Junior High students. We're back again for our last meeting of the year in which we're going to be finishing Macbeth. Perhaps you just watched part one of Macbeth and you're just spending the whole day watching through. Maybe it was a few days ago. Um, but we're just going to pick up where we left off and go ahead and finish it. You didn't have any assignments due. Um, just finishing up the school year. So let's let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. We are starting in Act 3, Scene 2. Get your copy of Macbeth out, whether it's on a Kindle or a tablet, or perhaps you printed it out from the website that I um, sent to you. Um, <clears throat> but we're just going to pick up in Scene 2. Where we left off, Macbeth has hired murderers to go lay in wait for Banquo. He, Banquo and Fleance are going out riding. And they're supposed to come back in time for a feast that Macbeth is having in the evening. Macbeth, who is now king. But he's going to plant murderers along their path to take out Banquo and Fleance because the witches told both Banquo and Macbeth that Banquo's descendants would be kings. And Macbeth wants to make sure that doesn't happen. So, in scene two, we're at Macbeth's palace. <clears throat> and we have Lady Macbeth and one of her servants come in. And she says, is Banquo gone from court? I, madam, but returns again tonight. Say to the king I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. She goes off to get Macbeth and Lady Macbeth is having a little talk with herself. And she says, Nought's had, all spent, where our desire is got without content. Tis safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. We got our desire, but we're not contented. Macbeth is, is off. I feel off. I, I feel like, you know, when Macbeth said, if it were done, when tis done, she says, I don't feel like it was. It's still sort of haunting us. Macbeth comes in and she says, How now, my lord? Why do you keep alone of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on? Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. Hey, Macbeth, why do you keep thinking about this? You keep dwelling. You keep dwelling on what happened. You seem quiet and withdrawn. And, and she says, things without all remedy should be without regard. If you can't fix it, don't think about it. What's done is done. He says, we have scorched the snake, not killed it. She'll close and be herself, whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. You know, what we did, it was just the beginning. There are still dangers to us to be taken care of. Of course, from the scene just before, we know one of the dangers he's thinking of is Banquo. And the fact that Banquo is going to have a dynasty, but he won't. But he says, just like a snake that you just wound, but it's going to heal and come back and bite you, that's what the murder of Duncan was like. But let the frame of things disjoint, both the world suffer, ere we will eat our meal in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. All right, they're both disturbed. They're neither one of them at rest or at peace, at rest or peace. Better be with the dead, whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace, than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. I'd, I'd rather be dead. At least the dead are in peace. We, we thought killing him would bring us peace because we'd have everything we ever wanted. But we're not at peace. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison, malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Lady Macbeth says, come on, gentle my lord, sleek o'er your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I love, and so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence, both with eye and tongue. Unsafe the while, that we must lave our honors in these flattering streams, 
and make our heart faces wizards to our hearts disguising what they are wizards are like the the visor the mask our faces are just masks we have to pretend to be kind and thoughtful and considerate of all the people at this feast and he tells her pay special attention to banquo okay we know that he intends banquo to never come to this feast he's just hired people to kill him lady macbeth isn't in on this one he's doing this one himself she says you must leave this he says oh full of scorpions is my mind dear wife thou knowest that banquo and his fleance lives but in them nature's copies not eterned they're not going to live forever and uh, don't worry about it there's comfort yet they are assailable then be thou jocund be happy ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight ere to black hecate's summons the shard-born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal there shall be done a deed of dreadful note before night fully uh, falls tonight before it's totally dark something's going to happen she says what's to be done be innocent of the knowledge dearest chuck till thou applaud the deed come sealing night scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day and with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale come night and and under cover of night i want something to happen thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which makes me pale what makes him pale worrying that banquo is going to have children that are kings light thickens and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood good things of day begin to droop and drowse whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse thou marvelest at my words but hold thee still things bad begun make strong themselves by ill so prithee go with me things bad begun make strong themselves by ill once you do something bad you keep doing more bad to make it more permanent and lasting so now in the next scene we go out with the murderers they've been joined by a third murderer sent by macbeth but who did bid thee join us macbeth he needs not our mistrust since he delivers our offices and what we have to do to the direction just yeah, don't, just, we can trust him. He knows exactly what we're doing. He obviously got his instructions from Macbeth. Then stand with us. The West yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the lated traveler apace to gain the timely inn, and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark, I hear horses, and we hear Banquo in the distance say, Give us a light here, ho! Then tis he. The rest that are within the note of expectation are already in the court. Everybody else who's going to the feast is already there. His horses go about. Almost a mile, but he does usually. So all men do. From hence to the palace gate make it their walk. They know the path that people normally take. So Bagwan and Fleance come in with a torch. The second murderer says, A light, a light, tis he, stand to it. And Banquo says, It will rain tonight. He still doesn't know what's going on let it come down and they stab banquo who yells out oh treachery fly good fleance fly 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 thou mayest revenge oh slave he dies but fleance escapes who did strike out the light was it not the way there's but one down the sun is fled we have lost the best half of our affair well let's away and say how much is done so they go to the to the castle and the next scene is in the hall where they're having the feast. And Macbeth is talking to everybody. And he says, you know your own degrees. Sit down. At first and the last hearty welcome. In other words, you know um, where to sit. You know your own degrees. There's an order of seating here based on who is more important. The Lord says, thanks to your majesty. Our self will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we will require her welcome. Pronounce it for me, sir, to all our friends, for my heart speaks they are welcome. Oh, 
but the first murderer appears at the door and Macbeth sees him out of the corner of his eye. See, they encounter thee with their heart's thanks. Both sides are even. Here, I'll sit in the midst. Be large in mirth. Anon will drink a measure, the table round. And then he goes to the door and talks to the murderer. There's blood upon thy face. Tis Banquo's then. Tis better thee without, within than he, I'm sorry. Tis better thee without than he within. I'd rather have his blood on your outside than in his inside. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat's cut. That I did for him. Thou art the best of the cutthroats. Yet he's good that did the like for fleance. If thou didst it, thou art the non pareil. There's nobody like you if you manage to get rid of fleance. Most royal sir, fleance has escaped. Then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect, whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad and general as the casing air. But now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound into saucy doubts and fears. But Banquo's safe? I, my good lord, safe in a ditch he bides with twenty trenched gashes on his head, the least a death to nature. Thanks be for that. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed. No teeth for the present. Okay, Fleance isn't married. He's not about to have children. I can deal with him later. He, he, he will breed venom later. He'll be a danger later, but not yet. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. Lady Macbeth calls to him, My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. The feast is sold that is not often vouched, while tis a making, tis given with welcome. To feed were best at home. From thence the sauce to meet a ceremony, meeting were bare without it. But, honey, come back. The point of having a feast is to be cheerful and, and convivial and be together, and you're over there talking in the corner to somebody. Um, you can eat at home, but when we eat together, we're supposed to share it together. Now, <clears throat> in comes the ghost of Banquo and sits in Macbeth's place, and Macbeth doesn't notice it. Macbeth says, sweet remembrancer, now good digestion, weight on appetite, and health on both. May it please your highness, sit. Here had we now our country's honor roofed, were the graced person of our Banquo present, who may I rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance. It'd be great if Banquo were here. I, I hope that he just forgot or was late and didn't have any problems. His absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. Please it your highness to grace us with your royal company. And he looks and he sees something and someone in his chair. And he says, the table's full. Here's a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. What is it that moves your highness? He's looked at the place and he sees who's there. And he says, which of you have done this? What, my good lord? Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. He's talking to Banquo and he's bloody. His ghost is bloody and he's looking at him. Ross's gentlemen rise. His highness is not well. And they start to get up, but like they don't see anything. There's something wrong with the king. Lady Macbeth says, sit, sit, worthy friends. My lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. Pray you keep seat. The fit is momentary. Upon a thought he will be again, he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed and regard him not. Oh, you know, he has these spells. He always has since he was a boy. Like, great, our new king has hallucinatory fits of madness. Nice. He's like, oh, just sit down. Don't worry. Then she goes to him and quietly says, are you a man? <sighs> Here she is again with the, be a man, be a man. I and a bold one that dare look on that which might appall the devil. Yeah, I must be. You can't believe what I'm seeing right now. Oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger, which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, imposters to true fear, would well become a woman's story at the winter's fire, authorized by her grandam. Shame itself. Why do you make such faces? When all's done, you look but on a stool. 
All right. There's nothing here. You know how you told me you saw that dagger in the air? It didn't really exist. What you're looking at now, it doesn't really exist. Prithee, see there? Behold, look. Lo, how say you? Why, what care I? If thou canst nod, speak too. If charnel houses and our graves must send those that we bury back, our monuments shall be the maws of kites. Oh my goodness, are, are cemeteries sending back their dead? Banquo, you're dead. What? Quite unmanned in folly, says Macbeth, or Lady Macbeth. If I stand here, I saw him. Fie for shame. Blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time, ere humane statute purged the gentle wheel. Aye, and since too, murders have been performed too terrible for the ear. There have been murders before. The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die, and there an end. But now they rise again with twenty mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. You know, back in the olden days when somebody got killed, they just died and they were gone. Nowadays, they come back and haunt you. What's the world coming to? Now, I wonder if he's thinking of not only Banquo coming to haunt him. You know, Duncan isn't literally haunting him in the form of a ghost, but he is haunting their lives. The deed they've done is having an effect, isn't it? Having a lasting effect. Lady Macbeth says, my worthy lord, your noble friends do lack you. Hello, you're in the middle of a feast. I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most, wor most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all. Then I'll sit down. Give me some wine. Fill full. And the ghost comes back. I drink to the general joy of the whole table and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss. Would he were here. To all and him we thirst, and to all, to all. And they answer our duties and the pledge. But then he sees the ghost and he says, Avaunt and quit my sight. Let the earth hide thee. Thy bones are marrowless. Thy blood is cold. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare at. You can't see. You got no eyes. You got no blood. Lady Macbeth's got a cover for him again. Think of this, good peers, but as a thing of custom. Tis no other, only it spoils the pleasure of the time. Just don't worry about it. Macbeth says, what man dare, I dare. Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros or the hirkin tiger. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerve shall never tremble. You know, I'm a, I'm a tough guy. I'm a brave guy. You can come to me in any wild animal shape and I'll be fine, but don't come to me looking like Banquo. Or be alive again, and dare me to the desert with thy sword. If trembling I inhabit then, protest me the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery, hence. The ghost leaves. Why so? <sighs> Being gone, I am a man again. Pray you, sit still. She says, you have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with most desired, dis both most admired disorder. He says, can such things be and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? You make me strange even to the disposition that I owe, when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine is blanched with fear. I can't believe you, Lady Macbeth. I'm terrified at looking at Banquo's ghost all bloody, and you just don't even change. She says, uh, Ross, the Lord Ross says, what sights, my lord? She says, I pray you speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Stand not upon the order of your going. You know how when they came in and sat down, he said, you, you know your order, sit down. You know your places. She says, all places are gone. Just, just go. Don't follow any ceremony. What's going on with the royal household is breaking up society. They, they don't follow the social courtly etiquette anymore. She says, just go. Good night and better health attend his majesty. A kind good night to all. And they leave. And Macbeth starts talking. It will have blood, they say. Blood will have blood. 
Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs and understood relations have by maggot pies and chuffs and rooks brought forth the secretest man of blood. You know, murder will out. Auguries, omens. It's not done when it's done. Murder will out. He says, what is the night? She says, almost at odds with morning, which is which? It's nearly morning. How sayest thou that Macduff denies his person at our great bidding? He invited all the royal lords, but Macduff didn't come. She says, did you send to him, sir? I hear it, by the way, but I will send. There's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. Ooh. Now we find out something else he's doing. He has a hired spy in the household of every single one of his lords. And he didn't actually invite Macduff to the feast, but he knows he wouldn't come. He knows he's on the other side. I will tomorrow, and betimes I will, to the weird sisters. More shall they speak, for now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good all causes shall give way. I am in blood stepped so in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious to go o'er. I'm crossing a river of blood and I've waded in so far, I might as well just keep going. Because turn around, no point. Strange things I have in head that will to hand, which must be acted ere they be scanned. I'm thinking things, things I have in head that will to hand that I'm going to do which must be acted ere they be scanned. Before I even take the time to think it over, I'm just gonna do it. I'm, I'm just gonna act. You lack the season of all nature's sleep. Lady Macbeth says you're not sleeping. It's not healthy. Remember, gloms hath murdered sleep, sleep no more. They're not sleeping. And he says, come, we'll to sleep. My strange and self abuse is the initiate fear that once hard use, we are but, but young indeed. All this fear you see in me is because I'm a beginner murderer. I'm just starting out. When I get more accustomed to it, I won't be like this. We are yet but young indeed. Okay, now we have a scene that um, switches out with the witches. Now, many many scholars think this was put in by someone else. It wasn't a Shakespearean scene. In fact, your version that you have may not even have this scene in it, but I'm going to read it anyway in case it does. Um, <clears throat> the witches are meeting Hecate, which I told you is the, so the queen of the witches. Why now? How now, Hecate? You look angrily. Have I not reason, beldams as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. And which is worse, all you have done hath been put for a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you. But make amends now, get you gone into the pit of Asheron, and meet me in the morning. Thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide, your charms and everything beside. I am for the air. This night I'll spend unto a dismal and a fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere noon upon the corner of the moon. There hangs a vaporous drop profound. I'll catch it ere it come to ground. And that distilled by magic slights shall raise such artificial sprites as by the strength of their illusion shall draw him on to his confusion. He shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes above wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. Hark, I am called. My little spirit, see, sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. And the first witch says, come, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again. So Hecate, the queen of the witches, has come to them and said, well, what? I wanted in on this. You're messing with Macbeth and you didn't, you didn't wait for me. And she says, I'm, I'm going to go, and there's this drop of uh, vapor on the moon, and I'm going to get it and use it for my magic spell, and I'm going to draw him on to his confusion. 
I'm going to show things to Macbeth that will lead him on in the path, but will confuse him. Okay, so if, you're, if your play didn't have that scene, don't worry about it. But if it did, that's what it says. Okay, now we're somewhere in Scotland. And Lennox is talking to another one of the Lords of Scotland. And Lennox says, My former speeches have but hit your thoughts, which can interpret further. Only I say things have been strangely born. All right. We've talked about this before, and it's made you think, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into it a little, a little more. Things are strange. Things seem very strange in Scotland. The gracious Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. Mary, he was dead, and the right valiant Banquo walked too late, whom you may say, if it please you, Fleance killed, for Fleance fled. Hmm. Kind of coincidental that Duncan gets supposedly killed by his sons. Then Banquo gets supposedly killed by his son. Seems a little odd. Men must not walk too late, who cannot want the thought of how monstrous it was for Malcolm and for Donalbane to kill their gracious father. Damned fact. How it did grieve Macbeth. Did he not straight in pious rage, the two delinquents tear that were the slaves of drink and thralls of sleep? Was not that nobly done? Aye, and wisely too, for twould have angered any heart alive to hear the men deny it. So that I say he hath borne all things well, and I do think that he had, had he Duncan's sons under his key, as, and it please heaven, he shall not, they should find what were twere to kill a father. So should Fleance. I'm afraid <clears throat> it seems a little fishy, and I'm afraid if, even though Macbeth seems on the outside to be sorry, I'm afraid that if he actually had Malcolm and Donald Bang, they would not live long. But peace, for from broad words and cause he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. He didn't go to the feast, and because of broad words, he's been talking against Macbeth. Sir, can you tell where he bestows himself? The son of Duncan, who from this tyrant, from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court and is received of the most pious Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from his high respect. Okay, Malcolm has fled to England and there he's waiting with King Edward of England um, and biding his time. Thither Macduff is gone to pray the holy king upon his aid to wake Northumberland and warlike Seward, that by the help of these, with him above to ratify the work, we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and banquets, bloody knives, do faithful homage and receive free honors, all which we pine for now. He's gone, Macduff has gone to beg Malcolm to come and free us from the tyranny. Nobody likes Macbeth at this point. We're all living in fear under this reign of terror. And this report hath so exasperate the king that he prepares for some attempt of war. King Macbeth is so upset that Macduff is gone trying to get help from England that Macbeth's getting ready for war. Sent he to Macduff? He did. And with an absolute, sir, not I, the cloudy messenger turns me his back and hums as who should say, you'll rue the time that clogs me with this answer. Macbeth sent messengers to Macduff and Macduff just blew him off. Macbeth, you're gonna be sorry for this. And that well might advise him to a caution to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. Some holy angel fly to the court of England and unfold his message ere he come, that a swift blessing may soon return to this suffering country under a hand accursed. I'll send my prayers with them. They're going to send someone else to tell Macduff, watch out, watch out when you come home, because you are on Macbeth's bad side. Okay, now we switch to Act 4. We're back with the witches. Thrice the brinded cat hath mewed, thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpier cries, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, into the in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad that under cold stone, days and nights, has thirty-one sweltered venom sleeping got. Boil thou first in the charmed pot. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. 
fillet of a finny snake in the cauldron boil and bake, eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's mummy, maw and gulf, in the rav of the raven, salt sea shark, root of hemlock digged in the dark, liver of blaspheming Jew, gall of goat and slips of yew, slivered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and tartar's lips, finger of a birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, make the gruel thick and slab, add thereto a tiger's chaudron for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Cool it with a baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. Okay, Hecate comes in. Oh, well done. I commend your pains, and everyone shall share in the gains. And now about the cauldron sing, like elves and fairies in a ring, enchanting all that you put in. So they're, they're brewing some sort of potion. They're doing their evil dance. And the second witch says, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. And in comes Macbeth. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is it you do? A deed without a name. I conjure you by that which you profess. Howe'er you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, Though the yesty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's germains tumble all together, even till destruction sicken, answer me to what I ask you. I don't care if the whole world falls apart. If winds take out castles and trees, you're going to tell me what I want to know. Speak, demand, will answer. Say if thou hadst rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. Do you want to hear us tell you or do you want our masters? Which we're, we're increasingly thinking this is evil. The masters are evil, demonic or Satan. But he says, call them, let me see them. Pour in sow's blood that hath eaten her nine pharaoh, grease that's sweatin' from the murder's gibbet throw into the flame. Come high or low, thyself and office deftly show. And out of the cauldron comes the first apparition. It is a head. Nobody but a head, and it's wearing a helmet. Macbeth says, tell me, thou unknown power. The witch says, he knows thy thought. Hear his speech but say thou not. Just listen to what he says. You don't have to talk. He knows thy thought. Who knows your thought? Who knows your thought? Your own brain, your own head. Is it possible this head is Macbeth? He knows thy thought. But Macbeth doesn't think that. He only listens to what, the, what it says. And it says, Macbeth, 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 beware Macduff, beware the thane of Fife, do you miss, dismiss me enough, and it disappears. So all he hears, beware Macduff, okay. Whate'er thou art, for thy good caution, thanks, thou hast harped my fear aright. I, I was thinking the same thing, that Macduff was dangerous. But one word more, the witch says he will not be commanded. Here's another, more potent than the first. A second apparition appears. It's a bloody child. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Had I three years, I'd hear thee. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Ooh, well, that's good news. Nobody born of a woman can harm me. Everybody's born of a woman, so I'm, I'm cool, I'm good. But he didn't look at the picture. A bloody child. Is there any way that people come into the world but aren't technically born? A cesarean section. Leaving a bloody child after the surgery. He doesn't look, he only listens. Well, now he thinks there's no problem. Then live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? 
But yet I'll make assurance double sure and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live, that I may tell pale heart hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder. All right. So apparently nobody born of woman can harm me, but just in case I'll kill you anyway, just to make sure. All right, now there's a third apparition, a, a child with a crown holding a tree, like a little tree or a branch. What is this that rises like the issue of a king and wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty? Like, who's this? He's wearing a crown, he's a child wearing a crown. Who's this? Okay, what child should be wearing a crown? Um, Malcolm, son of the former king. But they say, listen, but speak not to it. And it says, be lion-mettled, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. You're, you know what? Don't worry about any rumors you hear because until the forest, until the forest of Burnham, Burnham Wood marches on your castle, you're safe. Macbeth says, that will never be. Who can impress the forest? Bid the tree unfix his earthbound root. Unless you're tree beard. Trees don't march. Oh, but what is the picture? Somebody holding a branch, holding a tree. He ignored that, okay? Sweet bodements, good. This was good news. Rebellious dead, rise never till the wood of Burnham rise, and our high-placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature, pay his breath to time and mortal custom. Yeah, if, if I have to wait till the forest marches, I'm going to live out my natural life. Yet my heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me, if your art can tell so much, shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? I still want to know, are Banquo's family going to be kings? The witches say, seek to know no more. I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know. Why sinks that cauldron and what noise is this? The cauldron disappears and they say, show, show, show. Show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come like shadows, so depart. And this procession, the shadowy procession comes on. Eight kings with Banquo last and the last king has a, a glass a mirror in his hand and he can see more kings in the mirror Macbeth says thou art too like the spirit of Banquo down thy crown doth sear mine eyeballs and thy hair thou other gold brown brow is like the first and the third is like the former you all look alike you're all in the same family filthy hags why do you show me this a fourth <sighs> start eyes what will the line stretch out to the crack of doom Another yet? A seventh? I'll see no more. And yet the eighth appears, who bears a glass which shows me many more. And some I see that twofold balls and treble scepters carry. I mean, kings of Scotland and England. Horrible sight! Now I see tis true, for the blood boltered Banquo smiles upon me and points at them for his. What, is this so? Aye, sir, all this is so. But why stands Macbeth thus amazedly? Come, sisters, cheer me up his sprites and show the best of our delights. I'll charm the air to give a sound while you perform your antic round. That this the great king may kindly say our duties did thus wel his welcome pay. And they start dancing around and they just vanish. And he says, where are they? Gone? Let this pernicious hour stand I accursed in the calendar. Come in, without there, he calls to Lennox, who's been waiting. What's your grace's will? Saw you the weird sisters? No, my lord. Came they not by you? No, indeed, my lord. Infected be the air whereon they ride, and damned all those that trust them. I did hear the galloping of a horse. Who was it came by? Tis two or three, my lord, that bring you word Macduff is fled to England. Fled to England? Aye, my good lord. Time, thou anticipatest my dread exploits. Oh, I'm gonna, I was going to kill him, and he ran away. Shoot, I missed my opportunity. The flighty purpose never is or took unless the deed go with it. Unless you do things right away, sometimes you don't get them done. From this moment, the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. From here on, the minute I think of something, I'm doing it. And even now, 
to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff I will surprise, seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. No boasting like a fool, this deed I'll do before this purpose cool. But no more sights. Where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me where they are. Macduff has run away, but just in spite and anger, he's going to kill off all of Macduff's family. Now, the next scene, immediately we go to Fife, the seat of Macduff's uh, manor, and see uh, Macduff's wife and her son being warned by Ross, the nobleman Ross, that they're in danger. Lady Macduff says, what had he done to make him fly the land? She doesn't know why Macduff left. You must have patience, madam. He had none. His flight was madness. When our actions do not, our fears do make us traitors. He was no traitor, but it makes him look like one because he ran off. You know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. You don't know whether he was afraid and ran off or whether he's doing something wise. Wisdom? To leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansion and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly? He loves us not. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds, will fight her young ones in her nest against the fowl, against the owl. All is the fear and nothing is the love, as little as the wisdom, where the flight so runs against all reason. How, how could it be wise? How could it be loving for him to run off and leave us here? If he leaves a place because he thinks it should be left, but he leaves us here, why would he do that? Ross answers, my dearest cuz, I pray you school yourself. But for your husband, he is noble, wise, judicious, and best knows the fits of the season. I dare not speak much further, but cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. When we hold rumor from what we fear, yet know not what we fear, but float upon a wild and violent sea each way and move. It's a bad time when everything is so out of joint, everything is so messed up, you don't know whether you're coming or going, you don't know who's wise and who's not, who's afraid and who's not, whether you should be afraid, you just don't know what's going on. And that's what life is like in Scotland now. I take my leave of you. Shall not be long, but I'll be here again. Things at the worst will cease or else climb upward to what they were before. You know, circumstances always, there's gotta be a low point and then things start getting better. My pretty cousin, blessing upon you. And she says, fathered he is, and yet he's fatherless. My, my son here, he has a father, but it's like he doesn't because his father's gone. I am so much a fool should I stay longer. It would be my disgrace and your discomfort. I take my leave at once, and he leaves. She turns to her son and says, Sarah, your father's dead, and what will you do now? How will you live? As birds do, mother. What, with worms and flies? With what I get, I mean, and so do they. Poor bird, thou'dst never fear the net and her lime, the pitfall or the gin. Why should I, mother? Poor birds they are not set for. My father is not dead for all you're saying. Yes, he is dead. How wilt thou do for a father? Nay, how will you do for a husband? Why, I can buy me twenty at any market. Then you'll buy him to sell again. Thou speaks with all thy wit, and yet in faith with wit enough for thee. Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, that he was. What is a traitor? Why, one that swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so? Every one that does so is a traitor, and must be hanged. And must they all be hanged that swear and lie? Every one. Who must hang them? Why, the honest men. Then the liars and the swearers are fools, for there are liars and swearers enow to beat the honest men and hang them up. <laughs> now God help thee, poor monkey, but how wilt thou do for a father? If he were dead, you'd weep for him. If he would not, it were a good sign I should quickly have a new father. Poor prattler, how talkest thou? So she feels like they've been abandoned, all right? And they have this kind of merry banter back and forth. It's kind of lightens the mood before what's about to happen because a messenger comes in and says, bless you, fair dame. I am not to you known, though in your state of honor, I am perfect. You don't know me, but I'm on your side. I, I'm, I'm 
pro Macduff. I doubt some danger does approach you nearly. If you will take my home, a homely man's advice, be not found here. Hence with your little ones. To fright you thus methinks I am too savage. To do worse to you were fell cruelty, which is too nigh your person. Heaven preserve you. I dare abide no longer. Like you need to get out and you need to get out now. You are in danger. Whither should I fly? I have done no harm, but I remember now I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable, to do good sometimes accounted dangerous folly. What then, alas, do I put up that do I put up that womanly defense to say I have done no harm? I haven't done anything wrong. But that's not often a reason to feel safe in this world. The murderers come in and she says, What are these faces? Where's your husband? I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find in him. I hope he's nowhere hanging out with people like you. Here's a, he's a traitor. Thou liest, thou shag-eared villain. What, you egg? And he stabs the son. Young fry of treachery. He has killed me, mother. Run away, I pray you. And Lady Macduff runs off crying, murder, murder. Okay, the scene shifts to England. Macduff is there talking to Malcolm. Remember, he has gone to seek Malcolm's help to come back and claim the throne for his own, which is rightly his, clear his name, and get rid of the, tra the tyrant Macbeth. Malcolm says, let us seek out some desolate shade and there weep our sad bosoms empty. Let us rather hold fast the mortal sword and like good men bestride our downfall and birthdom. Each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face, that it resounds as if it felt with Scotland and yelled out like syllable of dolor. You know, it, it, Malcolm says, let's come, let's come talk. He's like, no, we need to get back home because every day somebody's dying. Malcolm answers, what I believe, I'll wail. What no, believe. What I can redress, as I shall find the time to friend, I will. What you have spoke, it may be so perchance. This tyrant, whose sole name blisters our tongues, was once thought honest. You have loved him well. He hath not touched you yet. I am young, but something you may deserve of me through him, of him through me, and wisdom to offer up a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry God. It's like, wait a minute. When I know what I'm hearing is true, I'll act. But you loved Macbeth in the past. He hasn't done anything to you yet because they don't know what's happened. And you know what? He may be paying you. This may be a trap. You may be on his side. I gotta be careful. Macduff says, I am not treacherous. Malcolm answers, but Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge, but I shall crave your pardon. That which you are, my thoughts cannot transpose. Angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. Though all things foul would wear the brows of grace, yet grace must look, still look so. All right, I, you're not, you may not be treacherous, but Macbeth is. Maybe he's using you. You know, devils appear as angels of light, but that doesn't mean that there aren't still angels. Angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. You, you may be legit. Macduff says, I have lost all my hopes. Perchance even there where I did find my doubts. Why in that rawness left you wife and child, those precious motives, those strong knots of love, without leave taking? I pray you, let not my jealousies be your dishonors, but mine own safeties. You may be rightly just, whatever I shall think. Okay, question number one, Macduff. Why'd you leave your family back at home? That seems suspicious, like maybe you feel like they're completely safe because you're working for and with Macbeth. Macduff answers, bleed, bleed, poor country. Great tyranny, lay thou thy basis sure, for goodness dare not check thee. Wear thou thy wrongs, thy title is afeard. Fare thee well, Lord. I would not be the villain that thou thinkst for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp and the rich east to boot. If you don't believe me, my country is going to rack and ruin. 
and I don't care what you think, I would never be the sort of villain that you suspect I might be. Malcolm says, be not offended. I speak not as in absolute fear of you. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each new day a gash is added to her wounds. I think withal there would be hands uplifted in my right. And here from gracious England have I offer of goodly thousands. The King of England has offered me troops. But for all this, when I shall tread upon the tyrant's head, or wear it on my sword, yet my poor country shall have more vices than it had before, more suffer, and more sundry ways than ever by him that shall succeed. You know what? Even if even if Mac di- but even if Macbeth dies and I take over, my country's still going to suffer. Mac- Macduff says, "Why should this be? Why should he be? It is myself, I mean, in whom I know all the particulars of vice, so grafted that when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow, and the poor state esteem him a lamb, being compared with my confineless harms." I'm so bad that when I'm king, everyone will think Macbeth was great. Macduff says, not in the legions of horrid hell can come a devil more damned in evils to top Macbeth. Nobody can be worse than Macbeth. I grant him bloody, luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious, smacking of every sin that has a name. But there's no bottom, none, in my voluptuousness. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons, and your maids could not fill up the cistern of my lust, and my desire all continent impediments would o'erbear that did oppose my will. Better Macbeth than such a one to reign. I I will take all your women. I'm just after the women. I'm the biggest, uh, most lecherous person ever. Macduff says, boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. All right, not putting limits on what you want is like having a tyrant live inside you. Think about that. Macbeth has not put limits on what he wanted. He'll do anything for it. And he's telling Malcolm the same thing. You've got to put limits on your want. If you want to be a man, if you want to be a king, you've got to have limits on what you want. It hath been the untimely emptying of the happy throne and fall of many kings. But fear not yet to take upon you what is yours. You may convey your pleasures in a spacious plenty, and yet seem cold, the time you may so hoodwink. We have willing dames enough. There cannot be that vulture in you to devour so many, as will to greatness dedicate themselves, finding it so inclined. There's going to be willing women to hang out with the king. Everybody wants to date the king, because he's powerful and he's rich. And you can do it on the side. Nobody needs to know. Malcolm says, with this there grows in my most ill-composed affection such a staunchless avarice, greed, that were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels and this other's house, and my more having would be as a sauce to make me hunger more, that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. Well, yeah, I'm also greedy. And guess what? I'll grab everybody's stuff and I'll even make up charges just so I can grab more loot. This avarice sticks deeper, Macduff says, grows with more pernicious root than summer seeming lust, and it hath been the sword of our slain kings. Yet do not fear, Scotland hath foisons to build, fill up your will of your mere own. All these are portable with other graces weighed. All right, so don't worry, there's, there's a lot of riches in Scotland. We, we can put up with that. We are willing to put up with your greed, Malcolm, because you have other graces. But Malcolm says, but I have none. The king becoming graces as justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude. I have no relish of them, but abound in the division of each several crime, acting it in many ways. Nay, had I power, I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace, confound all unity on earth. Yeah, I I have no graces. I'm I'm just a rabble-rouser troublemaker. I'm terrible. Macduff says, oh, Scotland, Scotland. Malcolm answers, if such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I have spoken. He says, fit to govern? No, not to live. O oh, nation miserable, with an untitled tyrant, bloody sceptered, Macbeth, when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? 
since that the truest issue of thy throne by his own interdiction stands accursed and does blaspheme his breed. The true issue of the throne, the true king, says he's a rotter. The, thy royal father was the most sainted king. The queen that bore thee, oftener on her knees than on her feet, died every day she lived. Fare thee well. These evils thou repeatest upon thyself hath banished me from Scotland. O oh, my breast, thy hope ends here. All right, you're my last hope, Malcolm. And if you are what you say you are, I, I'm not going back to Scotland. It's over. Malcolm says, Macduff, this noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honor. Devilish Macbeth by many of these trains hath sought to win me into his power, and modest wisdom plucks me from over-credulous haste. But God above deal between thee and me. Macduff, don't worry. I was, I was fooling you. I was testing you. I'm not like that at all. Devilish Macbeth, you know, has sought to win me into his power. He sent spies, and I thought maybe you were one. For even now I put myself to thy direction, and unspeak mine own detraction. Here abjure the taints and blames I laid upon myself, for strangers to my nature. I am yet unknown to woman, never was forsworn, scarcely have coveted what was mine own, at no time broke my faith, would not betray the devil to his fellow, and delight no less in truth than life. My first false speaking was this upon myself. The first time I ever told a lie was the lie I just told you. What I am truly is thine and my poor country's to command, whither indeed before thy here approach, old Seward, with 10,000 warlike men already at a point was setting forth, now will together, and the chance of goodness be alike our warranted quarrel. Why art thou silent? Um, he says he's, got, he's already got help from England. I'm ready to go. Macduff says, such welcome and unwelcome things at once, tis hard to reconcile. His head's swimming. Like, Wait a minute, you just said you were a, a jerk. Now you're not. Now you're going to come help. I'm confused. Okay, a doctor enters. And Malcolm says, well, more anon. Comes the king forth, I pray you, the king of England, Edward. Aye, sir, there are a crew of wretched souls that stay his cure. Their malady convinces the great assay of art, but at his touch, such sanctity hath heaven given his hand, they presently amend. A bunch of sick people are waiting for the king of England to come out. Doctors can't help them, but apparently the king is so holy he cures them. This is Edward the Confessor. Um, known to be a very, very holy, godly king of England. Unfortunately, not much of a king, but very, very holy and godly. And, uh, and, and he cures people. So in, in, in Scotland, the king, Macbeth, is an evil and a harm. In England, the king is a cure. Malcolm says, I thank you, doctor. Macduff says, what, what's the disease he means? Tis called the evil. A most miraculous work in this good king, which often, since my here remain in England, I've seen him do. How he solicits heaven, himself best knows. But strangely visited people, all swollen and ulcerous, pitiful to the eye, the mere despair of surgery, he cures. Hanging a golden stamp about their necks, put on with holy prayers. And tis spoken to the succeeding royalty, he leaves the healing benediction. He, he, he has this healing power and it's said that he's passing it on to his children. With this strange virtue, he hath a heavenly gift of prophecy, and sundry blessings hang about his throne that speak him full of grace. Now, Ross comes. Ross has come from Scotland with a message, and it's not a good message. Macduff says, he, see who comes here. Malcolm says, my countryman, but yet I know him not. My ever gentle cousin, come hither. I know him now. Good God be times, remove the means that makes us strangers. I hope soon all the circumstances that make us be apart from each other will be gone and we can all live together in Scotland again. Sir, amen. Stand Scotland where it did? Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave, where nothing but who knows nothing is once seen to smile where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made, not marked, 
So many people are screaming, nobody even notices. The dead men's knell is there scarce asked for who. So many funeral bells, we don't even say who died. And good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps, dying or ere they sicken. Oh, relation too nice and yet too true. What's the newest grief? That of an hour's age doth hiss the speaker, each minute teems a new one. In other words, if you ask me what happened an hour ago, it's old news. Every minute has more bad news. Macduff says, how does my wife? Ross doesn't want to break him to it yet. Why, well, and all my children? Well, too. The tyrant has not battered at their peace? No, they were well at peace when I did leave them. Because they're dead. Be not niggard of your speech. How goes it? He says, you're keeping something back. When I came hither to transport the tidings, which I have heavily borne, there ran a rumor of many worthy fellows that were out, which was to my belief witnessed the rather for that I saw the tyrant's power afoot. Now is the time of help. Your eye in Scotland would create soldiers, make our women fight to doff their dire distresses. All right, well, okay. So I'm coming to tell you things are really, really bad in Scotland. And there's rumors that Macbeth has got more plans. He's on the move. Come on, our, our women would even fight. Our women would join the army to fight against Macbeth. Malcolm says, be at their comfort, we are coming thither. Gracious England hath lent us good seaward and 10,000 men, an older and a better soldier, none that Christendom gives out. Ross says, would I could answer this comfort with the like, but I have words that would be howled out in the desert air where hearing should not latch them. Macduff says, what concern they? The general cause? Or is it a fee grief due to some single breast? No mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe, though the main part pertains to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. Don't hate me, Macduff, but I have bad news. Macduff says, huh, I guess at it. Your castle is surprised, your wife and babes savagely slaughtered, to relate the manner were on the quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of you. I don't, I don't want to give you the details because that'll make it even worse. Merciful heaven, Malcolm says. What, man, ne'er pull your hat upon your brows. Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. Don't clam up, Malcolm says. Let it out. Let it out, Macduff. He says, my children too wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I must be from thence, my wife killed too? I have said. Be comforted, let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. Malcolm has no children, perhaps. Macbeth has no children, perhaps. They don't know what it's like to lose a son. All my pretty ones? Did you say all? Oh, hell kite, all? What? All my pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop? Malcolm says, dispute it like a man. I shall do so, but I must also feel it as a man. I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? Sinful Macduff, these were all struck for thee. Not that I am, not for their own demerits but for mine, fell slaughter on their souls. Heaven rest them now. Malcolm says, be this the whetstone of your grief. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart, enrage it. Use your anger, Macduff. Use your anger to go back and get revenge for your family. Macduff says, oh, I could play the woman with mine eyes and braggart with my tongue. I could cry. I could brag what I'm gonna do, but gentle heavens cut short all intermission. I don't want to waste time doing that. Front to front, bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's length set him. If he scape, heaven forgive him too. This tune goes manly. Come, go we to the king. Our power is ready. Our lack is nothing but our leave. Macbeth is ripe for shaking, and the powers above put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may. The night is long, 
that never finds the day. There's always a, a day, a morning at the end of the dark night. Okay, in Act 5, we come back to Scotland and we're in Macbeth's castle and a doctor and a waiting woman of Lady Macbeth are watching for her. And the doctor says, I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since his majesty went into the field, I've seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. All, yet all this while in a most fast sleep. She's sleepwalking. The doctor says, oh, a great perturbation of nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what at any time have you heard her say? That, sir, which I will not report after her. Ooh, she said very incriminating things about murder. You may to me, and tis most meet you should, neither to you nor anyone having no witness to confirm my speech. I don't want to get in trouble by telling tales about Lady Macbeth. And then she enters holding a candle. Lo, you, here she comes. This is her very guise, and upon my life fast asleep. Observe her, stand close. How came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. She has light by her continually, tis her command. You see, her eyes are open. Aye, but their sense is shut. What is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. She says, yet here's a spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. She goes on, out, damn spot, out, I say. One, two, why, then tis time to do it. Hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie, a soldier and a feared? What need we fear who knows it, when none can call our power to account? Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? The doctor says, do you mark that? She goes on, the Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands never be clean? No more that, my lord, no more that. You mar all this with your starting. The doctor says to the servant lady, go to, go to. You have known what you should not. You just heard her basically confess to the murder. She has spoke what she should not. I am sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. She keeps going. Here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh, oh. What a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. Well, well, well. Pray God it be, sir. The doctor says, this disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those who have walked in their sleep, who have died holily in their beds. Sleepwalking isn't necessarily a sign of evil or, you know, fatal illness. But she goes on, wash your hands, put on a nightgown, look not so pale. I tell you, uh, yet again, Banquo is buried. He cannot come out of his grave. The doctor says, even so? They killed Banquo too? Lady Macbeth goes on, to bed, to bed. There's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. The doctor says, will she now go to bed? Directly. Foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. Ooh, when people have a guilty conscience, they will speak it out at night. More needs she the divine than the physician. She needs a preacher. She needs a priest. She doesn't need a doctor. God, God, forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her all means of annoyance. Take away from her everything that she could use to harm herself. And still keep eyes upon her. So good night. My mind she has mated and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. Good night, doctor. Good night, good doctor. Okay. Scene shifts, and we are outside in the countryside near Dunsinane, near Macbeth's castle. And um, Menteith, Caithness, these are all soldiers and noblemen 
in Malcolm's army. The English power is near, led on by Malcolm, his uncle Seward, and the good Macduff. Revenge burns in them, for their dear causes would to the bleeding and grim alarm excite the mortified man. All right. It, they have such reason to be angry at Macbeth, such reason to attack and take him out that even a, a, a dead man would rise and fight based on the causes they have. Near Burnham Wood shall we meet them. That way they are coming. Who knows if Donald Bain be with his brother? For certain, sir, he is not. I have a file of all the gentry. There is Seward's son and many unrough youths that even now protest their first manhood. We have a lot of untried young men in the soldiery. What does the tyrant? Great Dunsinane he strongly fortifies. Some say he's mad. Others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. But for certain, he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. All right. Some people say he's crazy. Some people say he's just angry, but he's losing control of the government. Now does he feel his secret murders sticking on his hands. Now minutely revolts upbraid his faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. They only do what they're told because they're afraid of him, not because they love him. Not a good thing for a king. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. The title, the kingship, hangs on him like a robe that doesn't fit him. He's just a dwarfish thief. Who then shall blame his pestered senses to recoil and start when all that is within him does condemn itself for being there? No wonder he acts kind of weird. His conscience boils up and attacks him from within. Well, march we on to give obedience where tis truly owed to Malcolm. Meet we the medicine of the sickly wheel. Malcolm is the medicine. And with him pour we in our country's purge each drop of us. Or so much as it needs to do the sovereign flower and drown the weeds. Make we our march towards Burnham. Okay, now we're back inside the castle. Macbeth says, bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. What's that boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that know all mortal consequences have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth. No man that's born of woman shall e'er have power upon thee. Then fly, false thanes, and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. And a servant comes Apparently the servant looks kind of scared because he says, The devil damn thee black, thou cream-faced loon. He's all pale. Where gots thou that goose look? There is ten thousand geese, villain? Soldiers, sir. Go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers, Patch? Death of thy soul. Those linen cheeks of thine are counselors to fear. What soldiers, wayface? The English force so please you. Take thy face hence. Satan! I am sick at heart when I behold. Satan, I say! This push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. I have lived long enough. My way of life has fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have. I'm tired. I'm tired and all the things you get as you get older, friends and honor and love, I'm not going to get them. But in their stead, curses, not loud, but deep mouth honor. People just say good things, but they don't mean it. Breath, which the poor heart would fain deny. <laughs> Excuse me, and dare not. Satan! Satan comes in. Satan is not Satan, it's uh, his servant. What's your gracious pleasure? What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. Tis not needed yet. I'll put it on. Send out more horses. Scur the country round. Hang those that talk of fear. Give me my armor. How does your patient, doctor? Now he's going to talk to the doctor. 
Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow? Raise out the written troubles of the brain? And with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon her heart? Can't you cure her? Can't you cure her mind? The doctor says, therein the patient must minister to himself. Macbeth says, throw physic to the physics to the dogs. Oh, none of it. Doctors, the doctoring art, that's no good. Come, put my armor on. Give me my staff. Satan, send out. Doctor, the thanes fly from me. Come, sir, dispatch. If thou couldst, doctor, cast the water of my land, find her disease, and purge it to a sound and pristine health, I would applaud thee to the very echo that should applaud again. Doctor, I wish you could cure my country. My country is diseased. Wish you could cure that. Put off, I say. He's talking to the guy putting on his armor. What rhubarb, senna, or what purgative drug would scour these English hints? Hearst thou of them? Aye, my good lord, your royal preparation makes us hear something. Bring it after me, he says of his armor. I will not be afraid of death and bane till Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane. Remember, till the forest marches on me, I've got nothing to be afraid of. The doctor says, were I from Dunsinane away and clear, profit again should hardly draw me here. They couldn't pay me enough to come back here as soon as I'm gone. All right, the scenes kind of go thick and fast now. Scene four, we're out in the country near Burnham Wood again. Malcolm says, cousins, I hope the days are near at hand that chambers will be safe. We doubt it nothing. What wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham. Malcolm says, let every soldier hew him down a bough and bear it before him. Cut a branch and carry it before you. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery air and report of us. He won't know how many of us there are because the branches will be in the way. It shall be done. We learn no other but the confident tyrant keeps still in Dunsinane and will endure our setting down before it. As far as we know, Macbeth's holed up in his castle and he's, he's just going to wait out a siege. Malcolm says, "'Tis his main hope. For where there is advantage to be given, both more and less have given him the revolt, and none serve with him but constrained things whose hearts are absent too." Everybody has jumped ship and gone to Malcolm's side, except for the people who don't have a choice, his, his servants. "'Let our just censures attend the true event, and put we on industrious soldiership. The time approaches that will with due decision make us know what we shall say we have and what we owe. Thoughts speculative, their unsure hopes relate, but certain issue strokes must arbitrate, towards which advance the war, all right? Soon we're gonna know who's gonna be the winner. Very soon we're gonna know how this is all gonna come out, and the only way to know is just move forward. He says, Thoughts speculative, just thinking. They're unsure hopes relate. You hope what's going to happen, but you don't know. Certain issue strokes must arbitrate. We got to get in there and fight. All right, scene five. Back in the castle. Macbeth says, hang out our banners on the outward walls. The cry is still, they come. Our castle's strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here let them lie till famine and the ague eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them dareful, beard to beard, and beat them backward home. Okay, were they not forced, reinforced, with those that should be ours? If a bunch of people hadn't left us and gone to them, we could go beat them in the field. And then they hear a cry. They hear a noise of women. And he says, what's that noise? It is the cry of women, my good Lord. He says, I have almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my fell hair would at a dismal treatise rouse and stir as life were in it. There was a time when women screaming in the night would have freaked me out, made my hair stand on end. I have supped full with horrors. Direness familiar to my slaughterous thoughts cannot once start me. I've seen such horrible things, and I've done such horrible things, Nothing frightens me anymore. Women screaming in the night, don't care. 
doesn't startle me. Then he, Satan, his, his servant, enters. He says, Where, wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. We're going to find out later that apparently she took her own life. Now, Macbeth gives one of the most famous speeches of this play. <clears throat> she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Shakespeare's not saying this is what life is like. A mass murderer tyrant is saying this is what life is like. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Nothing changed. Time just goes on. Like time has frozen. He killed Duncan and time is frozen. Out, out, brief candle. What's life like? Like a candle. You just blow it out. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. Life is like an actor in a play. And you go out and you do your little piece and then you leave the stage. Nobody cares. It is a tale told by an idiot. Full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Life is worthless. This is what the path that Macbeth has followed has led him to. Life is worthless. I'm not afraid of anything. I don't care about anything. There's nothing to care about. A messenger comes in and he says, Thou comest to use thy tongue, thy story, quickly. Speak up. Gracious my lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but I know not how to do it. Well, say, sir. As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon methought the wood began to move. Liar and slave! Let me endure your wrath if it be not so. Within this three mile you may you see it coming. I say a moving grove. Hey, Burnham Wood is coming to Dunsany. If thou speakst false, upon the next tree shalt thou hang alive, till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost this, the same for me. Does for me as much, sorry. If you're telling me a lie, I'm hanging you. Not hanging you, but hanging you until you just starve to death. And you know what? If it's true, I don't care if you do it for me, because hope is lost. I poll in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane. And now a wood comes to Dunsinane. Hey, I'm starting to think those witches, they, they played me. They set a trap for me. Equivocation is saying one thing and meaning the other, or using saying something in two different senses, not giving full information. They did give him true information, but not all the information. And he's starting to think, like Banquo thought, they are devils. Arm, arm, and out. If this which he avouches does appear, there is nor hint, flying hence nor tearing here. If what he says is true, it's done. I might as well go out and fight. I begin to be a weary of the sun and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack, at least we'll die with harness on our back. I just don't care about life anymore. I don't even care whether I live or die. I might as well just go out there and fight. All right, back to the army. Malcolm says, now near enough. Your levy screens throw down and show like those you are. You, worthy uncle, shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff and we shall take upon us what else remains to do according to our order. Fare you well. Do we but find the tyrant's power tonight? Let us be beaten if we cannot fight. Let, let him go down or let us go down. Make all the trumpets speak. Give them all breath, those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. Okay, now we're out in the countryside. Macbeth has gone out to fight. He's wandering through and he says, They have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly, but bear-like I must fight the course. In Elizabethan times, they used to take bears and tie them to a stake 
and then put dogs on them to harass them. It's called bear baiting. It's kind of it's kind of mean. All right. But he's saying I'm like a bear tied to the stake. I can't, there's nowhere to turn. There's nowhere to run. And I'm just going to have to let the dogs bite me. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one am I to fear or none. So he's still holding on to hope. He understands the witches have given him bad information, but yet he's still holding on to hope. It's like, okay, but pff, yeah, but they still said nobody born of woman can hurt me. So maybe I'm still invincible. So young Seward comes in. What is thy name? Young Seward says, thou be afraid to hear it. No, though thou callest thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. He says, my name is Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, no more fearful. Thou liest, abhorred tyrant. With my sword I'll prove the lie thou speakest. They fight, and Seward is killed. Macbeth says, thou wast born of a woman. But swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, brandished by man that's of a woman born. I, I, maybe I am invincible. Then in comes Macduff. Beware Macduff, remember, the witches have told him. Macduff says, that way is the noise. Tyrant, show thy face. If thou be slain with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I want to be the one that takes you out. I cannot strike at wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. I don't want to hire with, uh, fight with these hired mercenaries. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword with an unbattered edge I sheathe again undeeded. I'm using this sword to kill you or I'm just putting it away. There thou shouldst be. By this great clatter, one of greatest note seems brooded. Let me find him, fortune, and more I beg not. All right. So he's, he's looking for Macbeth. He's following the noises. He hears more alarms. Malcolm and Seward come in. This way, my lord, the castle's gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The noble thanes do bravely in the war. The day almost itself professes yours, and little is to do. We've almost won. We have met with foes that strike beside us. You know, there's the people that were on Macbeth's side to begin with change sides and start fighting with us. Enter, sir, the castle. They've taken the castle, but they still haven't found Macbeth. So we get to the last scene of the play. Macbeth walks in and he says, why should I play the Roman fool and die on my own sword? You know, those Romans used to, when all hope was lost, they just committed suicide. Why should I do that? Whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. If anybody else is left alive, I'd rather see gashes on them than me. And Macduff comes in. Turn, hellhound, turn. Of all men else, I have avoided thee, Macbeth says. But get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I've already killed too much of your family. Macduff says, I have no words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. And they fight. But Macbeth during the fight, he says, thou losest labor. You're wasting your time. As easy mayst thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword impress as make me bleed. You could slice the air as easily as you can slice me. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. Go fight someone you can wound. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. Macduff says, despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee. Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Guess what, Macbeth? I wasn't born I, I, was, I came into the world by cesarean section. I'm the bloody child that you saw in the apparition. Ha, take that. Oh, and Macbeth knows he's done for. This was the last thing he was clinging to. Macbeth says, Accursed be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. The tongues that led me on with all these lies have made me dare more than a man and turn me into an animal. And be these juggling fiends no more believed, the witches, that palter with us in a double sense, that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. All right? They, 
palter with us in a double sense. They, they double talk. They equivocate, he said earlier. They tell us partial truths. They tell us things that are kind of true but not partially true or tell us how they might not, uh, how they should be understood. He says, I'll not fight with thee. Macduff says, then yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. If you won't fight with me, surrender. We'll go make a spectacle of you. We'll have thee as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole and under which, here you may see the tyrant. We're gonna put you on display like a circus. Because you know what, you're not a man anymore. You dare do more than a man should dare and you became none. Macbeth says, I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. I'm not gonna have like peasants throwing tomatoes at me. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed, being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. The forest came, you weren't born of a woman, but by golly, I'm going for it anyway. Before my body, I throw my warlike shield. Lay on, Macduff, and damned be him that cry, first cries, hold enough. I'm not surrendering. They fight, Macbeth is killed, Malcolm marches in, all right? I would the friends we miss were safe arrived. Seward says, some must go off, and yet I mean, some, some of them are gonna have to die today. By these I see so great a day as this is cheaply bought. I'm sure we've lost some people, but I see a lot of living people around here. I'm pretty sure we won at very little loss of life. Malcolm says, Macduff is missing and your noble son. Ross tells Seward, your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he was a man. The which no sooner had his prowess confirmed in the unshrinking station where he fought, but like a man he died. Then he is dead? Aye, and brought off the field. Your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth, for then it hath no end. Don't, don't let your sorrow be measured by how much he's worth, because he's worth so much you would never stop sorrowing. Had he his hurts before? In other words, were his wounds on the front of his body, which means he was fighting, or were they on the back, meaning he was running away? Ross says, I on the front. Seward says, why then, God's soldier be he. Had I as many sons as I have hairs, I would not wish them to a fairer death, and so his knell is nulled. Malcolm says, he's worth more sorrow, and that I'll spend for him. He's worth no more. They say he parted well and paid his score, and so God be with him. Here comes newer comfort, and here comes Macduff holding Macbeth's head, the armed head. He knows your thoughts. Here's Macbeth's head. Hail, King, Macduff says to Malcolm, for so thou art. Behold where stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy gold kingdom's pearl that speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine, hail King of Scotland. In other words, the, everybody's speaking the salutation in their minds. They're all hailing you King in their minds. Let's all hail him out loud with words. Hail King of Scotland. And Malcolm says, we shall not spend a large expensive time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. We're going to reward you for this. My thanes and kinsmen henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor named. What's more to do, which would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who as tis thought by self and violent hands took off her life. And it's one thing they need to do is call back everybody that's fled the tyrant and his evil queen. This and what needful else that calls upon us, by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure time and place. So thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at Scone the end. You have read or read with me a Shakespeare play. What led Macbeth on to make the decisions he made, do you think? 
Did he have a flaw? He seems to be very ambitious, doesn't he? He was already thinking about being king, even before those witches greeted him. And that brings us to another idea. Demonic powers, when they tempt a person, don't tempt them to do something they had never thought of, that's something they don't want to do. They play on the things you're already thinking of, ideas you're already entertaining. And Macbeth was already favorably disposed to the idea of being king, and apparently it had occurred to him, and he had spoken with Lady Macbeth in the past, that perhaps he might be king someday. He was very high in the king's uh, estimation, and, and that perhaps getting rid of the king could be a path to that. So he, he wanted more, more, more. More honor, more glory, more fame. And he bought it at the cost of his soul and his life. I hope, it, I hope you've enjoyed reading Macbeth with me. I hope it was interesting to you. And I really want to urge you, as I said um, earlier, get a copy of this and watch it. Shakespeare plays are not meant to be read the way we've just done. They are meant to be acted out. And the BBC plays has a wonderful, uh, pretty, pretty honest, good version of Macbeth. Um, I know it was wonderful in the sense of I'm not real fond of some of the actors, but it's not uh, violent. It's it's certainly family friendly enough to, to watch together. And uh, I sent you a link to that. Um, if I haven't, please remind me and have me do that for you. Uh, and so when the libraries are reopened, please order that from the library. I, I really urge you to watch it. I was hoping that we would get together and watch a movie uh, together to end up our year. And uh, right now it looks like that's not going to happen. I don't know when that's going to happen. Perhaps if things change over the summer, I might get in touch with you and you could all come over to my house and enjoy a movie, a medieval themed movie. But till then, it's been a joy uh, having you guys as my students this school year. Thank you for all your hard work and your questions. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you know where to find me. You can call me. And uh, if you're going to be continuing class with me next year, I will see you in, in the fall. And if not, I hope that this has really uh, opened your eyes to some of the things about medieval times that you didn't know before. I should have given your papers back to you or given you feedback on your papers by now. Um, but uh, let me know. Let me know if you have any comments, questions, and have a great summer. Bye-bye.